Hi everyone, today I'm talking about the microgenetic approach. Um, this is a short video, hopefully only about 10 minutes, uh, and I'm going to take you really through the basics of what the microgenetic approach is. But maybe before we get into it, just have a think about whether A, you've heard of this approach before, uh, and whether or not you've used it before. Because if you have, hopefully this will just consolidate what you already know, um, and if it's new, hopefully it's going to add something to your repertoire. Okay, as any good teacher, we have some learning objectives. Um, understand at a very surface level, yeah, because it's a short presentation. Um, ideally, I'd love for you to walk away with an understanding of how the microgenetic approach differs from other common approaches, the key characteristics and key theorists of the microgenetic approach, and how I've applied the microgenetic approach in my own PhD research. Okay. So this is my visual representation of perhaps some of the key approaches to understanding change so, or, or exploring change. And when we think of change, we can think of learning. Okay, so obviously we're working in the Faculty of Education and we often are thinking about how we're measuring student learning, how we're measuring teacher learning. Um, if you're in a school, you're measuring student learning or your own learning regularly. And these are some of the most common approaches to measure learning or to measure change. So the first one there is cross-sectional, right at the top there. Um, the horizontal line there is the time, or the period of learning, um, and the vertical line there is the cross-section line. So we take kind of a snapshot um, where, let's say hypothetically, you know, I've taught a unit and at the end I take, you know, I, I do a summative assessment and then I make inferences from that summative assessment for the type of learning that's taking place or the process of learning that's taking place. More or less, more or less it tends to be observed changes that I infer from that test. I can't, I can't really make too many claims around the process of change, how quickly it happened, the breadth of change that happened, um, the rate, things like that. The second one down is pre-post. So again, now we've got sort of two measurements being taken, one at the start, one at the end um, of whatever time period that is. Um, we're comparing those two points. So usually it's with the same group so that we can make a fair comparison. Longitudinal is building on that pre-post pre in that we've got more time points or more data collection points um, over a longer period of time. Sometimes, you know, one to three years, you know, in between each of these kind of data collection points. Longitudinal being over, you know, long period of time. And then we've got the microgenetic approach and you can see that there um, in comparison to those others uh, other common approaches that the microgenetic approach is a much smaller timeline but has quite a large number of data collection points in that small time frame and that is probably the key difference between the microgenetic and the others. The microgenetic term was sort of in, it was it was introduced by Heinz Werner in 1956 uh, in relation to a series of what he called genetic experiments uh, where he was looking at um, cognitive development in, in students and he was looking at the, the, the micro changes in their psychological states and so micro means small genetic means origin or genesis isn't it so we're trying to sort of use this fine-grained approach to identify the origin of the change there's three key characteristics um, that this sort of consensus in the research literature. Robert Siegler and colleagues, he has quite a large program of research in this field, and his three characteristics are the ones that seem to be cited, cited often in the sort of microgenetic approach or microgenetic methods um, articles. And so I wanted to run you through those three key characteristics. The first one, oops, apologies, the first one there is observation span, a known period of change. So we have to know that some form of change occurs during this period, whether it's you know, a 12-week period. We have to have some idea that, that there's some form of learning that's taking place. The density of observations are high relative to the rate of change. So in this example, you know, again, think of this as a short time frame, maybe, maybe 12 weeks, um, and every second week there's, there's some sort of data collection. Uh, and that might be suitable if compared to whatever it is that we're, we're investigating, the rate of change, so the rate of learning occurring is, um, is not as fast as the number of observations or not as high as the number of observations that we have in place. 
And the last part, which is really key to the microgenetic approach, is that the analysis of that data is an intensive analysis. We really get into that data because there, there typically tends to be quite a lot of it and it's in depth. Um, we're really looking at the sort of minute, the fine grained changes um, to try and identify um, you know, what was the cause of these changes? Where did they come from? What was the pace at which they occurred? Um, were they gradual? Were they sudden? Um, all these different questions when it comes to change and learning. Okay, so I mentioned this, I, I um, did a quick scope of search with the term microgenetic back in March, um, and it'd probably be worthwhile going back and doing a, a more recent one now, being a few months on, so March 2019. Um, this was the graph that sort of came from Scopus in, there were 578 documents that were listed, um, and you can see that the majority of the documents sort of around the late 1990s started to, to come into play, and that's not even a lot of documents really, um, but there has been kind of this proliferation since um, the late 1990s. Uh, the other thing I did was that I um, actually looked at microgenetic and teacher education. Um, I searched those two terms together, and only one document um, resulted from my search. And so it suggests that perhaps, you know, the microgenetic method and micro microgenetic approach isn't highly used in the teacher learning, teacher education space. It has been used more commonly in student learning, so there's an opportunity there to, to apply these, this, this approach in teacher education. And the last part, last objective here I wanted to cover was that um, I wanted to share with you how it fits with my PhD research. Research question one, I've got a few research questions here, but these are condensed down um, for the sake of this presentation. The first one there, the school middle leaders epistemic cognition about self-regulated learning, change in response to a 10 week professional learning community about self-regulated learning. And so I've highlighted that in purple and that purple um, indicator, um, which you can see here, um, is the professional learning community. So it's 10 weeks. This is a 12 week period. Um, and every two weeks I conducted some observations. So I actually did a video recorded observations and audio recorded think alouds every two weeks. Um, so over the span of 12 weeks. Um, and then nine months later, I went back and I did some more observations and um, some more audio recorded think aloud protocols. I also used a pre-post um, approach as well in terms of some questionnaires that I used there, um, there, and again, nine months later. Um, but that kind of gives you an indication for how I kind of went about my approach. I was working with 16 middle leaders and I was looking to see if as they participated in this professional learning community, does their thinking, their decision-making processes, their knowledge, their beliefs, their behaviors change? And how do they change? What's the rate at which they change? The breadth at which they change? Are they sudden, are they gradual? Um, all these sorts of questions. And then I wanted to know, do they, do they last over nine months after the conclusion of the professional learning community? So that's a snapshot into um, my PhD research. So hopefully you have, um, you can reflect on this and think, oh yeah, to some degree, again, understanding it, perhaps a very surface level, how the microgenetic approach differs from other common approaches, the key characteristics and key theories to the microgenetic approach, and how I have applied the microgenetic approach in my PhD research.